thought I'd talk about Winchesters a little bit, uh, partly because I'm selling some of my collection, so the rifles will be gone. Um, but I think you'll find this a meaningful and, and useful video. I'll start with this uh, Model 94, and for a few years, uh, essentially because I didn't know that much about guns, uh, but I knew about Winchesters, like most people. I collected Winchesters and I had many Model 94s and of course you know you learn from other collectors more about what's desirable than really any book can teach you. Uh, this is a 1941. You can see it's a gun that's been used. By coincidence if you're into Model 94s or even if you're not, there, this looks like just a used 1941 Winchester, right? It's actually uh, quite valuable and I'll draw your attention on the bottom of the buttstock near the butt plate you'll see an oval shape and there's a, what this is called a broad arrow a lot of you may know this these were actually issued uh, to the government of Canada and were for uh, home defense purposes and there's a long story behind that and you know all kinds of additional information uh, that I don't know offhand, but it's readily available. So if you see a Model 94 and you look at the serial number and it kind of looks right for that period of time, there's a broad arrow there and there's a broad arrow here on the receiver. It's easy to miss these. And um, not many were issued. And, you know, this makes it a very collectible firearm, quite unique, kind of like the uh, Home Guard Model 99s. There were some of those too. Anyway, and then on the fore end, I doubt that we can pick it up, but there's another oval here, which is pretty clear with my, you know, glasses, but um, magnifying lenses. But <clears throat> uh, anyway, so get, that's actually not the point of the video. This is actually just a typical used Model 94. So people bought the rifles or the carbines. They use them and um, they, they the rifles carry evidence of use and they're still very collectible. Big mistake to try to refinish these or take away any of that historical character. Um, Winchester collectors are very particular about that, I find. This one's great, it's just missing the elevator. Uh, Boris as is usually the case, like new the guns were carried, but not fired that much. Anyhow, um, what's happened, I think, is because our lives are probably less interesting, uh, we, we don't use our firearms as much. I mean, some people do, but not many. Uh, so they're expected to not look like that. The people actually view them as investments, I think, just based on all the correspondence I receive. Uh, but I'm going to show you now the Japanese version and that this is actually the main, you know, one of the main points of the video. These are definitely worth buying. Um, it's hard for me to explain, but, um, well, let's just say the fit and finish of these Japanese versions of the Winchesters are just incredibly precise, you know, made by modern machines. Uh, I, when, when I compare them using my lenses, uh, the, the original has that character, uh, but these are, I would have to say, probably superior if you're looking for fit and finish. This is a 30-30, uh, completely useful, and I mean, truly, have a look at that, at that um, action width. You all know this, but it's worth reiterating, and this, I still don't think there's a handier firearm than a Winchester Model 94. Uh, maybe I'll stand up the other one and you can see, um, you know, very similar, but very different. And both exceptional in their own way. These ones people tend to use and then, you know, preserve as, as collectibles because one of these days they're gonna stop making them. I, I hear this every year and then I cringe thinking, we're so accustomed to being able to buy a Model 94 of this quality. And there are lots on the used market, but anyway, I, I bought this 3030 uh, carbine model. And then uh, one thing I wanted to point out to you, so this is handy, you know, the 30 caliber is 
is uh, kind of very comfortable in terms of the the bore diameter. The barrel is a lot lighter, but not too light. Just you know, if this was a thirty-eight fifty-five, it would be lighter still. Um, but this one is just about perfectly balanced, as is the original. Then, if you decide that you want to go do some long-range shooting. They turn out this absolutely superb longer barreled model. They call this one, well, model 1894. I think it's called a Sporter. I've shown it to you before, half round, half octagon. This is a tough situation, but consistent with how they were made originally. That crescent butt plate is actually not too bad, you know, if you have a coat uh, or something to to uh, protect your shoulder, but though if you get one of these digging into your into your arm, if you place the the butt plate wrong, um, it'll wake you up in the morning for sure. They the Japanese ones these days carry the safety that's unavoidable for obviously reasons. Um, and then I'll show you an unrelated rifle just because it's another example. I I think I've I looked at this with you before. Uh, this one, 6.5 Creedmoor model 1885, a little bit better grade of wood, just superb. And of course they make these, um, these sites, no, unfortunately no metallic sites, but again, if they stop making any, the, any of these, um, this would be a loss. And they're not, they're still not that expensive for what they are. Like they're exceptional rifles, uh, it probably think it'd be a good idea. Uh, you know to squirrel away a couple or one anyway uh, and then the last thing I want to tell you about on these videos is I get a lot of letters from well all kinds of arms manufacturers and some of the most amazing firearms are made in Ferlach Austria F-E-R-L-A-C-H I've mentioned them before and what they I mean they make great firearms um, in terms of the action they make single shots bolt actions they don't make any lever actions as you know um, and then I was thinking why are these rifles just so extraordinary and it's because of the wood they put just incredible wood on their firearms and now now I'll tell you something uh, that I probably have not mentioned if you run into a model 94 um, or a, you know a, a Remington Mohawk and you, you it, or a, a, a Winchester 88 and it has like Turkish walnut, exhibition grade walnut and beautiful stock. Uh, I, I probably put that together. Uh, for a few years, I, I, I just decided that these, this rifle can look as good as any Fairlock gun. Um, if you take, you know, French walnut, Circassian walnut, this especially is very easy to make. You could actually have it, you know, copied and then just do the final fitting and finishing. There's not even any checkering. And you wouldn't believe how different. Uh, I remember the Model 88s, I made a half dozen. And um, I, I don't know if I made any money on them, maybe some, but just, they look, they look like a million dollars. So I pull out a blank of wood. This would be probably, if I ever had the time again, this is very heavy, but that's not bad. Um, a b beautiful piece of walnut be so easy to put out it's just an incredibly attractive rifle and um, you know I don't know what the change in value would be probably disproportionate to the effort but I loved working on guns and those ones that I changed I don't know how many I made and I didn't mark them in any way which was probably silly I should have you know I, I didn't think much of myself or my abilities but in retrospect uh, they were they were they were great they were nice they sold very quickly for a lot of money but again not as much uh, you know as as the effort that went into them but I might do that with this one and and uh, since it's kind of a rare rifle and if they stop turning up these 94s out uh, the value will go up and as we've talked about before there's just something really special about a very attractive rifle. Anyway, I think if I did it, you'd be surprised how the character of the of the firearm changes when when you have that exhibition wood. The whole thing just looks entirely different. And frankly, the British guns and a lot of those guns that people pay the big bucks for, 
the action is unremarkable. You know, sometimes they're engraved. A lot of people don't like engraving. But really, what really changes the whole thing, not to flog a dead horse, but it's the wood. If you have beautiful wood, and this isn't a great piece, by the way. You can, I just like this. I bought this because the grain is, is it's going to be easy to get the grain right. And if I remember right, I think I bought this for, uh, for an 1895 405, and I want it to be super strong. And so I didn't mind if it was heavy. But, you know, you can buy different blanks that are heavier or lighter in a way stronger or weaker, um, although they don't correlate. It's, it's the grain architecture that matters. Anyhow, um, I thought I'd share that with you and we'll be back in the studio a little bit. We'll get in the hills too and do a bit of shooting. Probably we'll take this one out, this Model 94, and maybe that Creedmoor as well. And the broad arrow, yeah, if you come across the broad arrow, broad, or, broad arrow, anything, um, that's a very desirable um, uh, collector's item and there are guys that just collect the, those and they pay like in some cases thousands for them anyhow thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next video and as always take care till we meet again bye